Hello, I'm Scott Gresham Lancaster, and I am a musician, composer, performer, designer, sound designer, and hardware designer that has been involved in the idea of computer network music for many decades. And so I thought I would take some time to explain the historical roots of how that whole thing started and some of the work that we've done. I'm specifically focusing on work on the West Coast of the United States. You can reach me at scottgl at sonification.net or at uh, look at my website at http colon slash slash scott.greshamlancaster.com. So what is computer network music? From my perspective, it's a new genre of music practice where the interaction of the network with networks of personal computers generate notes and sound choices based on that network configuration. I'm going to get into details on these rough definitions as we go along. I feel this grew out of a, directly out of a cultural sense of a collective technological utopia that was kind of in the air from the 60s and into the 70s. The availability of personal tech, computer technology and networking made it possible for the first time. Now again, this only happened starting around 72 or so when the internet first showed up and those kind of tools were available to uh, you know, people on the street. The initial practice, uh, practice by a community of electronic composers and performers from the San Francisco Bay Area in circa 1978 or so. I'll get into more details on all this, as I said. So <clears throat> what factors led to the creation of network music? I personally feel like the McLuhan, Buckminster Fuller, John Cage influenced promise of technology utopia that's present in their work was part of the zeitgeist that generated this concept. So this affordable single board computers certainly made a big difference. Um, we have to remember that this was with the Kim 6502 single board computers at the beginning and very, very uh, basic uh, programming, but it grew from there. The notion of artificial life and emergent uh, behavior, emergent behavior became ever present in all of the various factors that led to uh, working in this. The utopian vision of the future is a, a very, seems very strange at first, but it was really Marshall McLuhan who said things like, uh, the computer, in short, promises by technology a condition of universal understanding and unity. For McLuhan, utopia is a unified consciousness of an awakened individual. He really had a vision of the use of media. He's famous for the media is the message. And what's actually true is the media is uh, the network in this case. And so the message is the network. Then you have Buckminster Fuller who comes forward with the idea, think of it. We are blessed with technology that would be indescribable to our forefathers. We have the wherewithal, the know-it-all to feed everybody, clothe everybody, and to give every human on earth a chance. Incredibly optimistic in utopia. Cage's own work uh, sort of circumvented the need for virtuosity and yet required a certain sort of adherence to procedural uh, alien, aleatoric processes that allowed pieces to maybe change with every performance, as music always does, but in a new way that was based on procedural and almost recipe-based sorts of approaches to making music. Ideas are one thing, what happens is another, said John Cage. That sort of gets... I thought it was very interesting, this uh, Black Mountain College period, uh, because they were doing all these sort of interactions. I mean, there's de Kooning with uh, Merce Cunningham and John Cage in the corner, and Buckminster Fuller was very involved there. Uh, it was a really a vision of a sort of freeform technological utopia. 
And then came the electric Kool-Aid acid test, and the soundtrack for that was live electronic music, with the first synthesizers being built by the young Don Buchla, who was part of the San Francisco Tape Music Center. And uh, just listening to that early psychedelic music, you hear examples of very early electronic music and the use of computers to control things was really f closely behind all that. That's just a little sample of something from an electric Kool-Aid acid test showing that the musical space was very unusual and, and unique and very technologically oriented. I'll point the, the viewer to the uh, whole catalog. If you don't know about it, take a look at it. It's uh, Stuart Brand now doing the, uh, uh, f uh, for the big long time project with the, with the, you know, the millennial long accurate clock. The, uh, what is it, the Big big Now or something like that. I forget the name of it off the top of my head. But Stuart Brand was very fundamentally part of the information culture that was around this. And it's very interesting to look back at that stuff. And you can find it at archive.org if you want to check it out. Here we have the first personal computers. I thought it was funny. Bite into an Apple, the first Apple One, was $666.66. So I wonder what they were up to. This is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They're in Palo Alto making the very first single boards. The Kim actually was the one that we, that were at the very beginning of this stuff we're using. It's a 6502 based as well computer that could be uh, used, you know, hand, hand assembled code and that kind of stuff to control. Also, there was this proto hacker culture going on. You had Steve Beck and you had, uh, you know, there's Wozniak and S Steve Jobs, uh, Captain Crunch, John Draper doing the hacking the telephone with uh, little electronic circuits and a lot of stuff like that. And there's Don Buchla and uh, just above my video image doing his best to, do, you know, uh, take things out. Then the League of Automatic Music Composers shows up. This is uh, really the inspiration of uh, John Bischoff, Jim Horton, Tim Perkis, uh, Rich Gold, uh, David Behrman was involved, so was Don Day. Uh, it was quite a collective of people that were just using computers uh, and for the first concerts that was a, just a heterogeneous combination of what each composer was up to, and then they would make a kind of interconnection between their computers and what they could do would influence what the other person was doing that and each had a separate microcomputer music generation system, and they shared different data streams with each other. So this is the very first sort of uh, instance of using uh, microcomputers to make music in that way. There was some really original type of thinking and art. This is a rich gold uh, sort of giving a representation of thinking. Another thing some of you synthesizer aficionados, Rich was the one who designed the first surge or people's synthesizer of a user front end when he was at uh, CalArts, the very early CalArts, the first years. Of so out of this grew a kind of DIY electronic and synthesizer culture. You can see things are funkier back then. <laughs> this is a picture from the league when it with Jim and John, Jim Horton, and John Bischoff and Tim Perkis and, uh, you know, watch out. Here's a little bit of the music, I think. Yeah, that's not playing. <laughs>
like I said, very unusual music. I'll, I, I'm including the entire PowerPoint uh, for you to uh, listen to the whole thing if you want. Let me go to the end of that because it's about 11 minutes long. <laughs> I don't want to do all that. So David Tudor, towards the end of his time, did something very interesting. I had the chance to working with this. It was his neural net synthesizer. Those of you who don't know about this work should really check it out. He worked with a guy named Mark Holler and uh, Forrest, uh, what was Forrest's last name? I can't remember. For, anyway, Forrest Whitaker. And they created uh, an electronically trainable analog neural net synthesizer that was... Uh, 64 nonlinear amplifiers uh, with an electronic neurons on the chip. So it was all analog. And uh, it was a giant feedback loop, uh, as per those of you who know Reminded by the Instruments, which is the David Tudor book that just came out by Yunnan. It's an amazing book that you should check out. Uh, you can get a full rundown on what that's about. Mark uh, was a designer with Intel, and he really worked with very closely with... Um, David Tudor to develop this, and it, it has this sense of, uh, if you hear the music, it has a sense of being alive. Um, so all networks have fixed and semi-fixed nodes between which the data flows. A network is a set of nodes or clusters interconnected by links or channels. And the nodes can be single points or sub-complex networks. Like it's something like the hub, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, each individual composer has their own sort of network going to play the music, and then that network is connected out to the other guys just like the league stuff i showed earlier the channels are turned into flows of power and energy and or information and the interaction between the nodes and the traffic is slowly changing while much faster information between the nodes inform the observer so um, the structure of the network is slowly changing but the flow can be very fast and so you hear a lot of information, but the network is generally either fixed or moving very slowly. Observation, or in this case, the flow is listening to an information channel. So the more channels there are, the more polyphony essentially you have. So here's this simple concept, a uh, conceptual model of a musician as a network mode. The sounds come in, he listens and watches and has some comprehension then reacts and creates a new sound. And so this is the algorithm that a musician, that's, especially an improvising musician, is going through uh, in, the, in the context of you know, uh, making this kind of music. So I was involved in this Stetho project at the UT Dallas where we were taking a network model of the actual brain of aging uh, uh, humans and creating network-based music uh, based on that kind of stuff. Okay, okay, here we have one of the most interesting uh, areas, areas of soft tissue research, I think, the most unique to this project. This, project. this, this is, is uh, a highly, highly parallel, parallel version, version that, that uh, includes uh, the idea, the idea that, that everything, everything uh, uh, all, all parts, parts of the model, of the model are playing, are playing at once and you're experiencing, experiencing it as a soundscape. soundscape. So, so I'll just I'll go just inside, go inside and, you can and you can start to hear what's going on. Zoom in. So it's a bit closer to things that start doing different aspects of it. Anyway, that's just a little sample of that. Again, I'm going to leave the PowerPoint for you to go. But there's this notion of emergent behavior. By, 
by interacting with the network, you create a behavior that you can't anticipate and is based on what emerges from the way the network is interconnected. There's a mythical notion of vitality, Frankenstein, the golem, a technology that's used to bring life to something inanimate. John Coase's work in genetic programming was very influential for some of us in this period. We're thinking about making uh, programming that, that comes alive in the sense of like the golem and Frankenstein, but in a much more, you know, I don't know, less horrifying way. And then Kurt Weill had the idea of the singularity, which was this idea that arises. Bill Joy is warning why the future doesn't need us. It's a, a combination of all of these things. It's sort of like the AI warning that we're getting now from uh, thinkers. And you can uh, you heard a little bit of this in the in the David Tudor. There can be these cycles of repetition that end up sounding rhythmic and having a kind of uh, a echo of the kind of circular patterns that show up in loops and that kind of thing in in actual you know like more less abstractly generated music that's more of the nature of standard musical practice uh, okay so the hub is a group that i was involved in uh this is a picture of us in berlin in 19 no, 2005 i think but we were established in 1985, and uh, it's John Bischoff, Tim Perkis, Mark Trail, Chris Brown, Phil Stone, and myself. And we did composition and performance as a collective, exclusively using computer networks to structure the musical interaction. Now, this is often confu confused with some kind of improvisation, and, all, and although there was some improvisation, there was also a vast amount of procedural and... Uh, sort of indeterminacy and aleatoric structural work going on with that. It grew out of a culture and a milieu of ad hoc musicians commissioned to form as a group. Nick Collins asked us to come together after we did some, uh, a series at the lab on the Versadero in San Francisco called Network Muse, and it grew out of that. He brought us to New York and we played a concert in two different spaces sending information between the two uh, computers. A compositional process was done as a shared collective with individuals giving definitions and then thus working it out as an ensemble. The pieces were proposed as sort of like recipes and they were heterogenic, heterogenically uh, realized. In other words, everyone did their own realization specification. Uh, the first generation hub looked like that. It was a SIM single board computer with a shared memory. There were actually two of them, and then they could communicate with each other over a modem at 1200 baud between two spaces. Uh, we used that in 86, I think, in New York, maybe 85. Uh, there'll be, there's more detail. Yeah. Sure, the shared memory specification was the first thing that we had. And here's a piece called Glass Hand. You can read the description of the piece that John Bischoff supplies below. And if I can play this, let's see. Oops. Oh, uh, well, well. Uh, look up Glass Hand. It's on the C it's on the CD. And then we moved on to MIDI. Um, it uh, was a um, way of using the MIDI definition that came out in 1980 three but wasn't really realized in synthesizers very much by people in this thing if we look at me i'm getting if i get a message from john it's showing up as coming on channel two and if he gets a message from me it comes showing up as channel six and so on so we could see uh the messages from individuals in the ensemble by what midi channel they were on so here's a classic uh piece called wax lips was an attempt to find the simplest hub piece possible to minimize the amount of music structure planned in advance and in order to allow any emergent structure to arise Festival. 
this is one where we walked away from it. It was just like a net. Uh, okay, so the third generation hub was using open sound control, which many of you may be familiar with. And we used text strings like, you know, slash perform, slash Scott, slash amplitude, slash value, some value, like that. So we could send all sorts of messages that we defined as we went along. It was a big breakthrough because we weren't stuck to the 127 integer numbers that you could do with MIDI and give us floating point and a bunch of other things and the ability to define directly on. Here's an example of a piece that Chris Baum def defined at the uh, Jewish Contemporary Museum. We played it in this beautiful uh, tilted cube room when the museum first opened. And uh, each player played a mono thing and then, then the network com controlled the 3D ambisonic mix of the piece. I'll just play a little bit of this. Okay, so this is just a way of leading up to the fact that ZKM is publishing a book of our scores. It's gonna be released November, 2021. Uh, the details about the book are there uh, on the slide. It is uh, uh, been really a, a work of love, but a lot of uh, a lot of uh, work over the last few months to put this together. Really have to um, thank Ludwig Brunner. Uh, well, just a bunch of people uh, that are all named there uh, on the thing. I'm terrible with getting names right, so I'll just won't even do that. Um, but, um, there's a picture of us playing at the Red Hat, uh, Red Cat Theater in Los Angeles, uh, doing Big Notions, which is a piece where we chat with each other in the audience, sort of the closest to live coding that the hub ever got. So a lot of this music has turned into the live coding scene and it's something we always did was a little bit of live coding, but not... The style is so different and we were so non-rhythmically oriented that it's really not... I mean, it's a kind of a progenitor of, of live coding, but a different thing, really. So I think some of you might find that book very interesting when it comes out in November of 2021. This is the piece Noah Sphere, which uh, uses the noahsphere.princeton.edu data to um, send information from around the world uh, that sort of supposedly reflects the global consciousness. You can look into it. Okay, so this trend has evolved and every self-respecting, this is a quote uh, about a live group computer performance activity. Every self-respecting university music department now has a laptop orchestra or a similar form of live group computer performance activity. This is a thing that's... So years ago, so years ago, you mentioned electronic, mentioned electronic music, people music, thought of weird machines, machines with twisted, with twisted wires and antennas. Kind of like... Today, today we live in the world filled with synthesized sound, and now a new musical, new musical group, group was taking the whole idea, whole idea one step, one step or, should or should we say one, one lap, lap further. further. Here's Fox, Here's Fox 29's, 29's Gerald Copan. Unlike, Unlike the, the usual ensemble, ensemble this, one this one doesn't tune up. Tune up. They set their, they set their speakers, speakers in place, plug up their cables, their cables and, make sure and make sure they're, they're sufficiently, sufficiently wired. wired. Then conductor, then conductor go, go on, on needs them off. Them off. And they launch the music, music that sounds, that sounds like, a like a combination of bubble gums and signals six, from six, the six, front end, all in a day's work, day's work for the Princeton, the Princeton Laptop, laptop Orchestra. orchestra. Okay, so the laptop orchestra phenomenon is sort of trying to find a place in the traditional uh, musical uh, curriculum for this kind of network-based music. 
Uh, it is quite, it's fundamentally different in, in some ways in that, and th this is a list of, you know, different groups that are working in this area, doing all doing very interesting work. I'm not dissuading the work. It's just, a, a, it's a little bit more homogeneous is the thing that everyone is playing code that is given to them by the composer, the same code. Uh, and it's more of an orchestra concept. There is a conductor. There is, you know, it's not like a, uh, a more freeform uh, network structure. So there are these critical differences. The League and the Hub were heterogeneous networks that organized as a collective. Instrumentation and lorics are homogeneous, so they all have the same basic instruments, usually a Mac laptop or something like that. And the compositions for early ensembles were realized collectively. The loric performers are given instruments and scores that are pre-rendered and more traditionally composed. So it's just a different. So in conclusion, computer network uh, music is an evolving new form of musical social interaction and ad hoc idealistic origins have evolved into a more heterogeneous and uh, homogeneous, I should say, not heterogeneous, a more homogeneous and curricular based performance ensemble idea. The, the music created in this way creates a unique and palpable single musical genre space which I can testify is, is incredibly unique. Uh, uh, the experience of playing in one of these ensembles, if it's truly networked, is very unexpected. You're not sure if your instrument's gonna play or not. I mean, if you don't get the right data, and depending on the algorithm you're running, you don't hear anything. So it's, it's a different kind of way of playing music than where you, like playing the piano, you know when you push down the key, you're gonna hear a note and that kind of thing. But at the same time, you're sort of, uh, what did I think it was Sal Martorano called it? Uh, f it's like flying a school bus when he was running the Selmar construction, if you know what that is. Right? If you don't, look it up. Selmar construction was an amazing progenitor to all this. And I should have, in earlier versions of this slide deck, I had a, a picture of Sal's Selmar construction, which I should have included and I didn't. But if you look it up, it's fantastic. Sal was an amazing uh, genius. Okay. I guess it's time for questions, and we're at the end of this thing. I look forward to speaking to you about uh, what your thoughts are about the idea of computer network and its relationship to live coding, which is a, is a certainly a, uh, a very active area in this way of doing music, but different. It's uh, Live coding is a different thing than what I'm describing here. Okay.